Hi everybody, my name is Arti Parikh and I, today I'm here to talk about Go and why it's a really important language for enterprise development today. Everybody is being here in this room, it's pretty crowded, I think. It's the largest audience I've ever spoken to and so I'm pretty excited to be here. Uh, I am a newish engineering manager. Before that, I mostly worked in startups. Uh, for the last three years, I've been writing in Go. And so, um, and then I started the two meetups that uh, Ashley mentioned um, in Silicon Valley. So, um, rankings. Let's talk about the TOB index, which is like the one where like we saw Go skyrocket and then like it went down, but like it's going up again. Rankings matter, right? So it, it is an indicator that the language is getting popular. Why is it getting popular? Uh, what, what, was, what is happening is that a lot of startups are, had, had, have adopted Go, and they have found success with that, right? So Uber is pretty much Go um, with their microservices and all of that. Uh, there's a lot of Go at Segment, if you know Segment. So there's a lot of startups that were writing in Go, and they found it really fast, and they found productivity was high, and they also found that they were using less resources. So as a result, um, you know, performance, productivity, and simplicity. So it's been it's been great. So that's. And now enterprises are starting to pay attention. They're like, oh, we also want to do this. We can save money. Uh, and also, we can find good developers. <laughs> so um, I, uh, people say history repeats itself. I don't think it repeats itself. So I think that we have all of these like, bad things that happen in history. And then in the next generation, we try to fix them in some way. But I don't know if we actually fix them. We make more of a mess or whatever. We're doing something. And so it happens in programming languages, too. I love Mark Twain, so I have his code up there. Um, so, so going back in history, so this slide is actually going back to 1970, and I, uh, I wasn't alive in 19, you know, I was alive, but I wasn't writing code in 1970. Uh, so, but uh, all these companies were writing, you know, business applications. So this is an enterprise application development pitch, right? Go is good for enterprise application development. And so when we talk about that, we're talking about invoicing and payroll and finance and all of those things that business logic stuff that we that that was running on COBOL based systems on proprietary systems and then came the open systems the open architecture and you know x8 x386 and all of that and um, a lot of c and c++ was being written but it wasn't it wasn't taking on for like the business application needs, right? We were there was there was this like, oh, this is causing this is too hard or this is this has these problems and so C plus plus and and this is again like Ashley said this isn't about uh, you know which language is great or what which language is good for which you know system that you're writing if you're writing low level stuff C C plus plus were great but they weren't great for business applications. And that's where you know Java's timing in the early 2000s was like perfect, right? I've written a lot of Java. Um, I raised my children <laughs> writing Java, but uh, yeah, yeah. My daughter is taking AP Computer Science now, and she has to study Java. So I'm helping her with recursion and all of that. So, <laughs> uh, but why not C++? Right? C++ is on the list of the most difficult programming languages in the world. Right? It's it's number ten. Uh, but like, I think Haskell is number one for me. I've tried <laughs> I've tried to learn Haskell many times. I have the books and you know several books <laughs> bookshelves of uh, you know. The FP books, but it's it's a hard language um, to learn. And uh, you know, if you've been doing application development um, and you are in the enterprise application development world, it's not well suited. And going back again, you know, Java was like perfect for its time, right? At the time when Java came in the early 2000s, it was like groundbreaking. We're like, oh, we don't have to deal with like CMake files and autoconf and build tools and like write for the, compile for this and compile for that and all of that. So it, it, it changed things. And memory safety, you know, which was the earlier talk today, was important in this, in this area because Java was, was garbage collected. And memory safe, uh, no pointers. Um, so, 
this is sort of a little bit of history. So I have some history with Java. I was young, I was like really excited about like coding and I was uh, doing all of this stuff, you know. Every time it's so, a new article would come on O'Reilly. O'Reilly was like our water cooler, just like Hacker News is today. So <laughs> we're like, oh, this article came on Hibernate. Now everybody's excited about Hibernate and Gavin Newsom. I don't know if anybody knows, remembers his name. Mark Fleury, who wrote JBoss and like changed things because it was open source. Uh, and like change things from WebSphere. I don't know if anybody here knows that, those names. But uh, Extreme Programming, anybody? Anybody read that book? Yes, Kent Beck, yes, oh yeah. Yeah, that was groundbreaking. So, <laughs> Wesley's here. <laughs> yeah, so um, ex the, that book like changed my life, right? Because like JUnit, like unit testing and like all of the innovation that happened during the Java years was really amazing. I, at least it was for me. Uh, so, and then design patterns, and like we were all like innovating on all of these things. Dependency injection, Spring, like we're still using Spring. That is the sort of what enterprise application developers are using everywhere. Maven, you know, uh, how to do dependencies was beautiful, right? Is you had the uh, Maven sitting locally on your local system, and then you had like you know all the layers up. And I see the excitement around VS Code today. And it's a little bit of history because the Eclipse plugin architecture <laughs> reminds me exactly of what you know, VS Code is today. Because I wrote plugins in Eclipse. I was so like, into all of this. It was, it was a good time. And, and I was promoted. I was an architect. Uh, and it was like, hey, I have an A in my title. I was an architect for a healthcare startup. And I was writing a lot of abstractions. You know, that was the thing, I loved it. <laughs> so I was already abstracted, we were already abstracted from the JVM, like we don't know what's happening on the hardware. And then we're like writing frameworks upon frameworks. And it was fun, it's fun to write that. Right here, you know, I can just like do this and like all of this stuff happens on its own. Um, so that's, that was sort of like my story. Um, but what happened as a result was like, engineers on the ground floor who were coming in, they were like, this is tedious. This is like verbose, like why am I doing all of this like, you know, factory builder, blah, 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 and then another this, like to, to write a thread in Java was like six lines of code and like <laughs> executor thread factory, blah, 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 and then something <laughs> inside. So it was crazy. It was the, I felt like it was like object oriented programming extreme, <laughs> extreme object-oriented programming. Heavyweight frameworks, it was like, you know, startup times were slow. You would just sitting, you know, like uh, how many times you were sitting and just watching JBoss startup. And we had this discussion at PayPal to Rohit the sitting in the audience. And we talked about, you know, how Spring Boot did come to the rescue, but still like, you know, Java was slow. Um, and um, for concurrency things, you know, Java's, uh, um, concurrency model is OS threads map one to one, right, with Java threads. So you couldn't, you know, that was the limitation. And then I went to this conference and I met Dave Thomas and I read his book. Uh, anyone, Dave Thomas? Pragmatic programmer? Oh my gosh, only two, three people. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's Bruce Tate, uh, he wrote this book, um, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, and he tweeted this out, said, Dave Thomas ruined Java for me. <laughs> and I saw that and I was like, that's me, he ruined it for me too. I read his book and then I read all of the Ruby books that came out and then it changed things for me. Um, and yeah, so my, my thing to enterprises, because this is an enterprise, you know, enterprise application developer conference is that developer happiness matters. <laughs> Don't underestimate it. Like, I was unhappy. I was like, hey, you know, I wrote all of this stuff, but like, I wanted to write in a fun language that made me happy, and Ruby made me happy. And, uh, and Ruby on Rails um, at the time, you know, convention over convocation. That was another like huge growth that happened in the community. And I also, um, this is the time that I also got involved in communities where I found uh, the Ruby on Rails and Ruby community to be like amazing. I was like, wow, this is a group of like really passionate people, you know, writing stuff, doing stuff that they're excited about. And um, that was a sort of, you know, my story. At PayPal, the story was Node.js. So the VP whose org I work in, Jeff Harrell, he's kind of like famous at PayPal for like heralding this big change with Node.js because Java, PayPal was like all Java. 
And then he came and, and, and I sat with him once. He's telling me his story. He's like, oh, you can't tell this to anyone. So I'm not going to tell his story. But like how he brought about that change is really cool. And so if you ever come to PayPal and have a one-on-one -on -one with him, you should talk, talk to him about that. And he was able to bring about big change at PayPal. And that you know, developer velocity at PayPal just like was boom, right? There's, you look up Node.js, uh, Java to Node.js story. And that was a big part of it, like in, in my discussion with him, was like developer velocity mattered. Like we wanted to ship products fast because uh, we, we wanted to keep up with the competition. So uh, not only that, but it made, you know, you see your code running and that's, that's important. But what happened after, right? <laughs> so yesterday, I don't know if how many people in the audience, Gary Bernhardt, follow Gary Bernhardt? Yeah, he's awesome. So yesterday he tweeted that he runs this conference, uh, Deconstruct Conf, which is really cool. Uh, if you all get a chance to go there, and he does also live coding and all of this. So um, he, he tweeted that, oh my gosh, you know, 10 years after the rise of these dynamic languages, <laughs> we're seeing like, fatigue, right? There's all these security vulnerabilities in these things. There's all this depend NPM install downloads the whole internet on my on my local laptop. It's like, okay, this isn't fun like anymore. Like what was fun 10 years ago is not fun anymore. Like we're back to like not being simple and uh, fun anymore. And and more than that, like I have this like maze. This is like the best image I could to describe like call back hell, <laughs> in my opinion. The, you know, just you're in the node event loop or whatever, and you're dealing with all of this, um, you know, crazy, like you can't like figure out how your code is working, right? So, because you have a state machine always to deal with, you know, with all of these callback things. And it's not, it's not sequential, like where you can just like read your code and say, oh, top to down, you know what's happening. You know, you have to kind of like go on these code paths. So, that's what we're facing right now, and I, you know, people were facing. And then the the other thing that was like, you know, people who were like close to the hardware, like the C C plus plus folks, are always like, you know, they know more than you always because they're close to the hardware. They're like, you know, you're writing all this code in scripting languages, but you're not using all the cores. And that was the message that people were getting. Hey, you know, your Node.js is single threaded and you're not using all the cores or, you know, global interpreter lock. And, you know, how do you leverage that? And there was, of course, there was another framework. I think PM2 is what people use in the Node world to scale uh, on the different processes. But then again, framework, right? It's not in the language itself where you could use all of the processors. So that was kind of, you know, the unease uh, with that. And then now we are here. And this is not my slide. I'll, I have attributed this to the person who created it. But I thought this was a really neat slide that showed, you know, how well, we were running on hardware. Then we went to, OK, you know, EC2 instances or whatever. Then we were like, hey, you know, we just need something even more simpler or like git push blah and like my code runs. And now we're like, we just want to run something. And you know, you all take care of all of the service, everything underneath. And I just, you know, just want my language to run. It doesn't matter what I'm running. If I ship you a binary, you should be able to run in on your server, you know, somewhere. And so serverless, it's not on. So I think that developers want this, right? They want even more simplicity. So we're going to this function as a service, <laughs> serverless. I'm sure like a lot of people were in, yeah, serverless is like this thing that people make fun of, but it's really about developer experience. Because as an engineer, like I just wanna, if I'm you know, in a product developer, product development teams, they're called PD teams at PayPal. I just wanna ship you know, my code and I wanna do a good job and I want the product to be good. Um, so that's, what, that's what's needed. And um, this is a quote from uh, Bala Natarajan. He's uh, sort of like, uh, he heads like all of build, trust, and release platforms at PayPal. It supports like 4,000 developers, and we have 2,500 microservices. And it's kind of crazy. Uh, one quote I heard from someone in the platform team at PayPal says like, if we, if we sneeze, PayPal shivers. <laughs> so like these, this really small core team supports lots of lots of developers at PayPal. And um, so, and there's a really great talk from our CTO too, um, from Google Nest, where he talks about, you know, how PayPal scale uh, operates at scale. 
Um, so his, his thing is he's kind of like, you know, I've seen so much in my life, Arti. Like developers keep shifting with language and every generation comes and they want more simplicity, simplicity. And you know, he saw that with Node.js. He's like, we're definitely seeing another shift now where things just run somewhere and you know, backends are running, front ends are running, and we just need to make this work for developers. And that's the new paradigm. You know, we, need to, we need to simplify it to that. And so I will end with that, and I will take a quick water break. <laughs> So it took me a while to get here, but I had to kind of tell my journey because you know my story with Go, right? So um, the designers of Go, how the language was designed is, is something when I tell people, they're like, really? They're like, yeah, the person who wrote Unix also wrote Go. <laughs> like, that's kind of a big deal. Like, you know, Bell Labs, somebody tweeted, Bell Lab refugees <laughs> wrote Go, <laughs> right? I th love that, I uh, love that tweet. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, these people like performance, they like languages that are simple. Um, Robert Greismar, when I was researching about him, I was like, oh my God, he wrote everything. He was in the JVM, he wrote the JavaScript V8 engine, also wrote the Chubby Lock server that you know, the cluster thing that makes Google work, all of the Google clusters work, like in Borg or whatever, right? So he wrote that too. I was like, oh my God. Uh, so, and then the face of the Go programming language is Rob Pike. He is like his brainchild. Um, he was also the original Unix team, and a lot of the Go ideas come from Plan 9, some of them. Uh, and he also wrote UTF-8, so Go source is UTF-8. Go, it's not UTF-16 like JavaScript and Windows and all of that. Uh, so it's in UTF-8. Uh, and uh, those are the designers. So it comes, from, it comes from that place, right? It comes from people who cared about performance, simplicity, and wanted things to run. And so I was on a Rob Pike's blog. And I've read this blog like five, six times. I recommend you all <laughs> read it too. And he, the trigger for him for designing Go was like he was, they were compiling all of this like C++ code at Google. And then he went to some you know, meeting about C++, you know, how, what they're doing to improve. And what the discussion was like, hey, we're going to add these many features in C++. And he's like, really? Really? Is this, do you not really care about developers at all? <laughs> you know, so again, going back to, I said, people were asking me, like, go, I was like, developer happiness. That's what this talk is about. Developer happiness. <laughs> so it matters all the way, right? He, he, people are unhappy and then go and build things in the languages they want. Um, so this is an interesting, like, I love to read, like, commentary on, like, where ideas came from. And um, I think that matters, like, because, Go may not be like the final destination, you know. Who knows? Like I'm excited about Rust too, and I'm excited about all this other stuff. But you know, you want to know where ideas came from, and this this was to me was really interesting. Where like, hey, we took C and we want to fix all this stuff. But while we were making it, we were like, it turned out to be something else. And uh, the, the, what they really wanted to do was because they were mostly programming in Python and C++. So that's what Go kind of looks like. So um, it's simple. So Go is a really simple language to start with, right? It has 25 keywords, low cognitive overload, you know, a for loop for everything. You don't have all of this other like, you know, seven different ways to do something. I remember submitting pull requests for Ruby programs and, you know, I would get like 10 different comments. Oh, you could concise it like this and you could fit it in one line and you could tweak this and, you know, there's like nine different ways to do something and like I'm spending more most of the time making my code look pretty versus like understanding how my code actually runs, uh, you know, where it's supposed to run. So, so I think that that changed, right? Like I can, I can spend all my life making pretty code, but if I don't understand that, you know, how it's operating or that, that becomes more important if I want to scale my applications. So 
so that's uh, sorry I lost <laughs> one second my train of thought so uh, my punchline here was like it feels like Ruby runs like C but then I wrote feels like scripting language <laughs> so I was a former Ruby programmer I still have a complicated relationship with Ruby <laughs> I love Ruby uh, so <laughs> uh, readability is um, what's paramount to them right so um, and then simple code um, is is debuggable like you could go in the Golang code right now on GitHub and start reading it top down. It's like, it's just fun. Like, hey, you know, I can go and read the HTTP library. I don't need no like framework for it. I can go and read like what's happening, you know, on the, you know, how Go channels are made, even that code, like you can go and read. Okay, this is H10 struct. Oh, that's how it works. You know, so you can actually go and read, read the code and it's readable. It's, you know, top down, you can figure it out. So I love that part. You know, it makes it makes it very accessible for me, and it can scale on large code bases where you have by large code bases. I I also mean I'm an engine manager now. I work at an enterprise company. Uh, I have ten developers in my team, and then I'll have you know a couple of interns. I'll have a couple of RCGs. Rohit is nodding his head, <laughs> and and you know there'll be like maybe a few senior developers. There'll be one architect. You're not going to get you're not in a startup world where everybody's a senior developer, right? You're, you're in an enterprise company, so somebody coming into your code base needs to be able to read it. It's, it's a very different need than working at a startup where everybody's a senior engineer and knows what, you know, like have built systems. So the other thing that enterprises need is stability, right? Stability of a language, I think this was really one of the big successes of Java was it was always backward compatible. Every release they came out with, the, it was backward compatible. They had the deprecated flag, you know, that, okay, don't use this. But you can, if you use it, it's still gonna run. You know, we're gonna make, make sure your code runs. And that, that really mattered. And that's, I think that's still like the big success of Java. And the Go community is paying attention. So Go2 is in the works right now. And, and one of the talks that I attended from Ian Wallace, who's on the Go2 team, was like, we're looking at that. We're looking at you know, the success of C with like not that many changes and the success of Java with not that many changes. And we want stability. And I think that was one of their things too, where you know, they, they don't add many changes in the language spec. So the focus for the Go team was, let's make compiler performant. Let's make runtime. <laughs> faster, you know, performance, 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 not, not like waste time on language features, right? So a little bit about who's using Go. Um, I think this slide is important because, you know, people may know, may not know that all of these things are, have written in Go. Docker's written in Go, Kubernetes is written in Go, etcd, CoreOS. Um, IPFS, I, IPF, <laughs> IPFS is an interesting project that I discovered, and it's a good one. Like, hopefully, one day I can contribute to something. Uh, it's a fun project, and you know, it's written in Go. All of HashiCorp stack is written in Go. Um, Prometheus, Open Senses, uh, InfluxDB, and this is so many other ones. CockroachDB, Vitess, Sugu is presenting here somewhere. It's all written in Go. Um, so, also these companies are writing in Go. Um, PayPal has a bit of Go in the infrastructure side right now, mostly, but we have Go. We're talking about Go. Uh, I have seen job postings from big companies looking to build Go framework teams <laughs> very recently in the Bay Area. So I can't name names, but they have also approached me, but <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. But yeah, Go, Go, <laughs> is, <laughs> Go is picking up everywhere, right? So there are going to be Go framework teams. There are going to be enterprise companies saying like, hey, you know, we're going to write microservices in, in Go. So this isn't just about infrastructure. I think it's, it's going to be more. Um, that's my thing. Um, the design of Go, right? It's natively compiled, statically typed, open source. I'll say all these things. It's on the slide, but I'll say it again. Uh, it's important because in the, I had an interview and someone says, oh no, Go, is it really natively compiled? There has to be a virtual machine somewhere. They just couldn't believe that it was natively compiled. This isn't an interview, it was a senior director asking me this question. So <laughs> it was pretty interesting. Um, it has concurrency primitives uh, you know, built in. That's 
some of the things that people love the most about Go, they'll come, oh, I, I came to learn Go because I want to learn about Go's concurrency model. So yeah, that's one of the things I'll talk about in, in the next slides. It's a C-like language. I think I had a lot more slides with code, but feedback I got from my mentor, don't put code on slides. <laughs> so I removed them, but if you later all want to meet me in the hallway, and I can share some code. Uh, but it's very simple, you know, it reads like C. So I mentioned about, you know, natively compiled. So you, this is a question, I think this is an important question. This is how, at least this is how I learn, is through FAQs and not by reading. So Go has a really nice language specification. If you are like one of those learners who learn from like reading the whole specification, back as nor forum and all of that, it's there. Go read it, like I struggled. It was not easy for me, so I jump around. So this is, why is it so big is because Go binaries include the Go runtime. It's all packaged together. You've got everything in one single binary that's running your Go code. Um, so the compiler, it's fast. It's really fast. It was, uh, earlier it was written in C, they ported it to Go. It's still fast. Uh, it's not as fast as the C one, and they, they admit it. Uh, but it's still fast. Uh, they're focused more on the runtime than the compiler to, for performance. There's dependency caching. You can do go build minus u, and you can cache your dependencies statically linked to a single binary. So for example, if you're linking like C libraries, for example, if you're using Kafka and you have libRD Kafka, you can link it with your Go binary and ship a single binary. If you're using the Kafka driver, I mean. I, I did that in a previous project, and you can do that. You can dynamically link too, but you can statically link the binary. There are provisions to do that. Um, and I put this slide, put this slide for cross compilation there because I feel like people really need to see that it does do all of this cross compilation across all these platforms and OSS. So um, that's um, you know one of the things. And there is also support for assembly, so you can write hand coded assembly. And there's a lot of pull requests that come from academia for the math libraries. If you look at, you know, if you're watching the Go, uh, Golang, GitHub, you'll see that on the math libraries for sine, cos, tan, and all of those, a lot of that is in assembly. And people are constantly tweaking, you know, people who are, that's their domain, are constantly making it better. Uh, which is great, right? Because we get a better language. So Go is not object-oriented. Uh, it's data-oriented. By data oriented, it, it has structs and it has methods that are outside of structs. They are not related. There is no class keyword in Go. There is no extends keyword in Go. So class extends, we don't have that. We just have structs like C and we have methods that are outside of structs. And so state and behavior is separate because it's based on the data, the struct. Um, and structs do a lo lot of other stuff too, like go behind the scene, does alignment and all of this stuff to make it compact. Very much like, because they're coming from the C world. I don't talk about it here because, you know, there's so much to cover. So, give me one second. I'll just go. So, Go uses interfaces to implement polymorphism. Again, like I mentioned, you know, with methods you can have multiple, in, uh, have you know something impl implement multi multiple interfaces. It also prefers composition over inheritance because we don't do the inheritance tree. And um, encapsulation is done with like three things. You've got the packages. You know, packages are like your. Um, they're not like Java namespaces. They're more like libraries. They're like completely encapsulated. You start thinking of them as Java namespaces, it's trouble. If you think of them as libraries, like, hey, I need to, like, this needs to live independently, you know, of, its, of everything else, then it, then it works. And it follows a very simple uppercase convention for things that are exposed out of, out of that package and things that are lowercase are not. So it's a very simple convention. And there's also this concept of internal which like you don't want it exposed at all, which is sort of like, um, you know, protected, I think. I don't know which paradigm to, but yeah. So you, you won't be able to access that, those portions of, portions of um, you know, a library that you're using. 
Uh, and you can embed structs inside structs. So type reuse is through embedding structs inside structs. Um, so language design. So this is interesting because people who, who, have, who haven't, like maybe you took a C class in college and you mostly written in Java or mostly written in languages that didn't have pointers, you come to Go and you're like, oh, Go has pointers. It has pointer semantics. These are not your C pointer arithmetic thing, so don't confuse the two. Pointer semantics is the same thing as Java references. Java is all pointer semantics. Everything is a pointer semantic in Java. Java doesn't have value semantics. And that's, that's something that, that, that is a, a concept that I feel like you know, people should tell up front somewhere. <laughs> you know, maybe I write a blog about it, because it's, it's a source of confusion. Because it was a source of confusion for me, too. I'm like, oh my god, these stars are scaring me. <laughs> pointers, right? Because I haven't used pointers in a while. It doesn't. Like, va so value semantics is really nothing but you know, saying, if people who came from C++ know this, it's just like about copying something into, instead of using it as a reference. So that's value semantics. And Java doesn't have value semantics, but there's a JSR open for the next release of Java to have value semantics. So the next, I think, which is the next one, Java 11 or Java 12? Yeah, that's going to have, that has a JSR open for adding value semantics. So, so look, of, look at pointer semantics as nothing but references, just like you are in your ordinary code. Like, use those more than you know, where, where you need to pass references. You can um, do low-level stuff with pointer arithmetic. I've played a little bit with it. You can you know, you import the unsafe and like, access like, things inside that struct with like, crazy you know, with uh, casting with unsafe. But don't do that uh, unless you have to. So one place where I've seen it is in Go's binary serialization package, gob. It's called gob, which um, is like is like Go's thing for like uh, doing service to service. And if you don't want to use gRPC, if you're writing everything in Go, you can use the gob library, and it does. Uh, and that's using uh, that was originally because to make it really efficient, Rob Rob Pike had written it, and he was using unsafe in that to do all of the uh, manipulation to make it fast. Um, so that's there. And Seago uh, is an option. And I have used Seago uh, for image processing in a previous company. That's the only place I needed to use it, because there's some things that, you know, you, you know who's, you're going to write all of, all of it in Go. I mean, for example, like <laughs> FFmpeg, right? <laughs> who wants to who wants to write it in go that's a, that's a hard library to like port to go right so so you you end up using c go for those kind of things right those libraries that that provide those values um, and um the other thing about go and i think it was in the previous talk to mention about zero value and so go does that too with uh, when when you say new or make or you know any of these things, you're not like instantiating a class like in Java or that, right? All you're doing is like you're allocating memory for this variable, and you're zeroing out that memory. So zero value is that it, you're doing that because this this whole zero value concept is interesting. I didn't come from the C world, but like the C people are really excited about it. I'm like, why are you all like always talking about zero value? I asked Bill, and Bill's like, because C had this problem where like. It would allocate memory, but it would not zero it. So you could do bad things. Like you could access things inside and like mess things up. And so Go takes care of that for you. If there's a little slight performance hit. You would never do this in C. And that's why, you know, because you're writing firmware in C, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do that, uh, anything with performance. But Go cares about data integrity first, right? So that matters. So, it, you know, things have to be accurate, consistent, efficient. You know, that, that's more important. Um, so I'll take a quick break again. <laughs> Sorry. So Go has testing built in um, in the tool chain. You've got Go tests. You've got the benchmarking tests. And I, I had a bunch of code associated with that. If anybody wants to look, I can talk about table-driven tests and how Go does unit tests. Um, there's also you know, how you can wrap benchmark tests uh, with that and and test race con race conditions. I mentioned everything was a reference, right? So yeah, you will run into race conditions. So Go has a race detector in the te in the testing toolchain built in, which you can run to detect these kind of errors. 
And there's also options for coverage, memory profiling, and other things. Um, and so it's, it's pretty good. I, uh, to be honest, I still find it lacking, <laughs> straight up. <laughs> I think we need a Go testing cookbook. Maybe some will, someone will write a Go testing cookbook that will tell us you know, how to do tests well. I mean, I still love, love the Java style of like, doing tests in a like, way, so um, in a very systematic way. And Ruby, too, had like, great you know, testing frameworks. Um, so I think this is an area where we could do more like open source and like contribute, you know, good testing frameworks. Um, concurrency. So there are some really great talks about concurrency in Go, and I saw all of them, and I still didn't understand concurrency in Go, and and like I finally get it, you know. So th it isn't about like r running on all of these processors. It's about um, you know, it's about multiple things, right? Concurrency is about out-of-order execution, right? If I go to a coffee shop and I ask for coffee and, like, I pay the money, but, like, there's someone behind me and, you know, there's things that can happen in parallel inside the coffee shop, the, the things that can happen out of order, I can pay first or somebody's doing something first. So it isn't about, like, using all of the machines in the coffee shop, for example. It's about, you know, you can do certain things out of order. And actually, uh, you all should t watch this talk from Samir Ajmani has a great talk on this uh, um, about concurrency. And he has this coffee example that like, really explains how concurrency works with channels and go routines and go. But that's, it's really about out, out of order execution. And so Go gives you Go routines. They are lightweight user space threads. They have, um, you know, and then Go has a cooperative scheduler that's in the Go runtime that's managing these Go routines for you. The scheduler is deciding where, you know, which Go routine is going to be run, which Go routine is, you know, blocking or whatever, and which Go routine needs, like, you know, is, is a syscall right now, so I need to go to the OS, OS level. So it's managing all of that. So you don't have to do that. Um, and, you know, so it's like a mix. It's, it's, it hits the sweet spot, right? So Node.js um, had like the event loop and it was managing all of the async uh, IO and blocking, non-blocking IO, I'm just mumbling right now. And then, um, but it, it wasn't doing, it wasn't going to the OS, uh, OS uh, level threads, right? But Go is doing all of that with this really amazing scheduler. A lot has been written about the scheduler. There's some great talks. My favorite talk is by Kavya Joshi at GopherCon. It's called The Scheduler Saga. You must watch it. She's amazing. <laughs> and so she's my hero. Uh, so yeah, you must watch that talk, The Scheduler Saga. Uh, and it explains how you know, Go handles all of these Go routines. There's a lot of literature on it, too, a lot of great blog posts. So yeah, so where, where was I? Yeah. I, the slide, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I talked about Go routines. So you've got your threads, right? And now you need to, uh, I talked about concur you know, concurrency is about out, out of order execution, right? So now how do I make sure which, what thing happens when, right? I need to signal, right? So there's like four things happening and you know, there's out of order execution happening, like this thing happened, this thing happened, but I need to signal these and bring it all together, right? So the channels provide the mechanisms that allow the Go routines to communicate. And that comes from this old, um, from this old paper written by Tony, H-O-A-R-E, you all can pronounce it in your heads, <laughs> from 1978. Uh, so uh, communicating sequential processes, and it's, uh, you know, it's a great paper. That, that's uh, one of the talks at GopherCon was also about implementing the paper in the original language, which was done by Adrian Crockford, so that's also a great talk if you like the academic side of things. That's a great talk to watch. Um, but that's what, you know, channels are signaling semantics. You know, I'm trying to signal what happens first. And so I'm orchestrating, um, you know, what's happening. So this, this is one of the patterns, and I've just picked one code example where I have a Go routine. Um, in this example, think about like I'm a manager and I'm hiring a new employee and I want my employee to perform a task immediately when they're hired and then you need to wait for the result of their work. 
And so you can't, you, you need to wait because you need some paper from them before you continue. And that's what this orchestration is about. And this is the semantics here. And so you make a channel, you run a Go routine, and then you're waiting for something to land before you can exit this function. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Go toolchain. A lot of people um, talk about toolchain in Go. It's really, really well written because uh, there's a lot of um, good tooling built in, uh, especially the Go format, Go fumped or whatever. It's like you, you don't have to talk about tabs and spaces ever, ever again. <laughs> it's like there's just one way to do formatting of all of your code. And you just do it the go way. It's in the tool chain. And it's there. The, there's go linting. There's go wet. There's other things that the tool chain provides. Uh, but it, it also provides really powerful <coughs> tools for profiling memory and CPU and blocking. And um, there's really some really great workshops. So we had a workshop for women who go a couple weeks ago where we did a Go tooling workshop where Francesc went through and like, you know, work, we worked through all of these um, examples and wrote code on, you know, the Go tool chain. Um, and, and then tracing, tracing, Go tool trace really helps you with like, you wanna see, you know, when garbage collection is happening, how many Go routines are running, you know, the GC pause or whatever. You know, if, you, if you're really into all of that, I wasn't into that when I was doing Java, but if you're into that now, you can, you know, now I'm into everything. <laughs> but, but like, it's, it's, it's kind of fun that you, could, you can do this very easily and it's built in. You don't have to do, download a special framework or a library. It's, it's part of, you know, Go. Um, error handling. So Go does not have exceptions. There are no, there's no exception hierarchy. And if you are like me and have written like a, all this code path with like tons and tons of exceptions and like, it's like, oh my gosh, that's like my main program. This is my exception program. <laughs> that's how, that, I used to write Java like that. <laughs> be, we, you had to, because that's that was the one way, you know, you had checked exceptions. And, and I think that Java improved exceptions from C++ and it made them better, but uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, now we're, we're taking it to the next level. Like I think with Go, errors are just values. You can do whatever you want with them. You have state and behavior. Oh shit, I'm sorry, I have more slides. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, and I had, so data structures, I'm going, I'm going really, really fast now. So data structures, right? Um, so that's, um, Go has arrays, maps, and slices. And if anything, you should read about slices. Slices is like the best thing ever. Uh, it just makes Go super fast. It's conti contiguous chunks of memory. It's not your dynamic array. It's not your array list. I was like confused forever. Slices, think of slices as its own thing and like read up on it and like just leave the old paradigms <laughs> when, you, when you start you know, reading up on this. And Go has this built-in thing uh, that, that manages all of that. So you can um, not manage all of that. Go has built in for like, if you want to do appends and length and all of that, it's, it's in the library. So it also has a rich standard library. All of this stuff is there um, and you can, you know, uh, read on it. I'm gonna go really fast. Um, API development, this is like at the heart of everything, right? I have written Swagger and lots of Go Swagger stuff. I have written like REST stuff, web frameworks are there, gRPC. This is a quick example of chaining middleware. And I put this in there because this is something that comes up that you have to do. Gonna go much faster. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a really important slide, so seven minutes, <laughs> uh, is that you should read up about the Go Network Polar. It's really, really amazing. So this is how, why Go's network library is amazing. That's why Cisco wants to use it and all these networking companies want to use it. It's just like, it does these amazing things. And there's great blog posts on it. Underneath, it just like abstracts all the different operating systems. Um, the community, we have Go for Slack, Golang mailing list, global conferences, women who go. <laughs> Future of Go, uh, there's stuff happening. Uh, with go to genetics is something that people miss improved error handling dependency management is something that the go team is working on 
And uh, my last kind of slide is that is for people who are writing Go frameworks. This is like my pitch. Please, please, please build for developer happiness. Don't build top-down frameworks that make your developers like unhappy. Build tooling that helps you know give developer autonomy. These are the learning resources for Go um, that I use. And um, my last slide is why I like Go. I feel like. I'm a programmer again. <laughs> I was writing business logic forever. I've lived in you know, API land. And I feel like I can finally write, you know, see what's happening. I, I'm, I'm attached to like, what's happening with systems. And I'm very excited about learning more and doing more. And there's a great blog post that I would recommend that's called Go has heralded the future for Rust and other the systems languages. It's an amazing blog. So like Go has all these problems. This is like it's it's a pretty you know easy to read blog post, but there's like pros and cons. But yeah, this is where we're going. This is what's happening with uh, you know the changes and things that are coming with Docker and containers and and Go. So thank you all for listening. <laughs> thank you so much, RT. All right, so we have about five minutes for questions. Okay. You went real quick, and so uh, okay. is there any folks who have a question about Go? Good, no questions. <laughs> no questions? Oh, Perfect. here we got one question. <laughs> nice question, nice So question. I have one rule. The first sentence of your question must be a question. <laughs> If Go does not have interfaces, what do you create that implements those interfaces? Go has interfaces. Yeah, Go has interfaces, yes. but I, I just think an interface is something that a class kind of uses, right? Yeah, no, so you have interfaces and then you have uh, methods, right? So when it's implicit. If you implement those methods, that are that the, that interface wants, then you then then you have your implementation. So I'll show you. What, where are those methods? Is that because that for me is a class? It's not a class. It's it's methods on the structs. I'll show you. I'll show you after. Yeah, I can show you some code. We have something similar in Rust, so I I, I know this, and it yes. is complicated to figure it out. It is. It is. It's way hard. Like I was like, oh my god, where are my classes? I was the same ah. way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Second question. First sentence must be a question. Yeah. Question around, uh, since this talk was around enterprise applications, right? I uh, just want to know, how, what is Go support for working with uh, databases? Yeah, so, so data, there is a database in the standard library, but there's also these abstractions that people have built on top of that, uh, you know, that you can SQL X and all of that that you could use to streamline. You could use ORMs if you want. In one, in one project, I used ORMs, and then the other project was a gaming company, high performance, and the CTO made us write all SQL by hand, which is a good thing. But yeah, you could do both. Other questions, all right. They made this room very difficult. I was just wondering if it is a, a good prototyping language. I have a lot of systems engineers that like to just oh, yeah. come up with some, some quick ideas. Yes. Kind of like a, uh, totally, CLIs, CLIs and fun stuff. And I want to teach my daughter Go this summer because I want her to learn, like she's learned all this Java, but like prototyping is perfect for that so you can see what's happening. Awesome, I think we have time for one more. Or you can have a couple of minutes more of a break. Uh, let's thank RT again, thank you so much.